And Mr. Ash Nodd said we're right back live at Viewpoint. They're high on the hill, WLCN, Lazy Road, County Road 2250. We have a stellar guest with us this morning that uh, Judith Kay and I are enjoying talking about Lincoln College and their new, which I like to talk about anyway in many aspects, but we won't go there right now. We're talking about the museum and the new museum uh, in the Lincoln Center. Uh, before we took a commercial break in, I posed a question to you about the folks who are d d helping us develop that. They're over here in Rantoul. Would you like to t speak about that just a minute and tell us uh, what they're doing? And, and uh, it's neat to have some place so close to us that uh, we're working with. Well, the group that's working with us to design the new museum is called Taylor Studios, uh, based out of Rantoul, Illinois. Uh, they focus on exhibit design and uh, fabrication, uh, which is really just putting the pieces of the puzzle together for the new museum. Uh, they designed the exhibits. Uh, they also designed, uh, designed some exhibit cases for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but more specifically, on the second floor in our immersive area, they have been designing special interactive exhibits that are going to be really, really neat to see uh, over when we have our grand opening in April. Uh, we have a lot of audio where you'll get to listen to different individuals who knew Lincoln. Um, so when you go through the second floor, you're not having a historian tell you uh, what Lincoln was like. You have Lincoln's personal friends telling you uh, what Lincoln was like throughout his life. Um, but you also have Lincoln telling bits and pieces of the story, too. Can't tell a Lincoln story without Lincoln. Um, so we have a lot of quotes that we're using uh, on the second floor. And what's really unique about that sp specific m model of education that we're using is we are looking at primary sources, original sources that uh, depict Lincoln's life. So we look at letters that Lincoln wrote, um, letters that he received from friends. Also, uh, we are using what is known as uh, Herndon's informants interviews. So a number of interviews that William Herndon, Lincoln's third law partner, ended up uh, collecting when Lincoln was assassinated in 1865. Uh, he went around uh, talking to Lincoln's friends and wrote down their accounts of what they remembered of the, the late president. And we are relying on some of those sources as well, which becomes quite tricky. Um, if you s have studied William Herndon, he has a very questionable past, but he also has a very interesting one in regards to his relationship with President Lincoln uh, before he became president. And Mr. Herndon has some stories that are very useful and very knowledgeable that are backed up by other sources, other letters, newspaper accounts, speeches. But then there are some interviews that he had that are not quite so reliable that we've had to come into question and try and find some artifacts to match up with it. But one thing we did keep in mind when we were designing the second floor and studying these different interviews uh, were the fact that if these interviews did not have any backup primary sources, then we weren't going to use them. But on the second floor, you will hear from Lincoln's friends on Lincoln's life, which is really unique and really exciting. That theme that you're following in your new museum, uh, to me, sounds like it might be kind of unique to, to look at the man through his, through his cohorts. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, how did you come up with that? Well, um, over the years, uh, different museum, museums have tried to tell the Lincoln story. Um, specifically, the Presidential Museum has a very unique experience as you walk through Lincoln's life. Um, but at other museums, they tell their story through artifacts. And we are trying to merge both of them, uh, make them work together. Um, and we primarily looked at uh, primary sources because when you look at history, you always have a historian telling you the story. You have someone interpreting history for you. And this experience, listening to Lincoln's friends and what they wrote about Lincoln's life, uh, you learn from the actual people who knew him versus a individual who studied his life, which 
is very unique and not many uh, museums use that. Uh, they may quote um, a friend of Lincoln's now and then, but to actually sit and listen to someone talk about Lincoln's life and see their picture and kind of visualize a conversation with them, that is unique within itself. And they aren't all his secretaries of the departments in government. There, you've gone into people who were the the uh, maids, as it were, in the homes and so forth. Uh, that is a recent project that I'm currently working on. But in the museum itself, uh -huh. um, you will hear from Judge Davis, who's from mm -hmm. Bloomington. Uh, you'll hear from Lincoln's law partners, uh, John Todd Stewart. Uh, you have William Herndon telling a story, and specifically, you have Logan. Uh, Logan was. Uh, one of Lincoln's most influential partners and basically you'll get to hear from individuals who knew him on a personal basis so uh, Billy the barber who cut Lincoln's hair and you also had um, Joshua Speed who let him stay at his place of business in Springfield when he first moved in 1837. I think Jim is trying to tell us that uh, there's a call is it? Oh do we have a call? All right. Th there's a headphone we'll our, right there, and put our headset you right on there. Hold Mrs. that up to your ear, then you can hear yeah. what the, oh, Judy what and the person says. And we're going to invite the caller. Good morning, whomever it is. Say good morning to us. Good day to all. Uh, the answer to your to your question uh, at the beginning of your show was January 1969. That was the date of the fire. Yes, it was. Oh, thank oh. you. <laughs> thank well, you. That, that You're welcome, neighbor. We appreciate that very much. That depends some credibility to the ex actual date there. Do you have any other input? Do you have any questions for Ann? Uh, how are you, Ann? I'm great, Don. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, this caller is our very loyal volunteer at the Lincoln Heritage Museum. He comes in every uh, Monday and Wednesday, and he is um, helping us come up with some more volunteers for the new museum which is very important. Well, it's glad that Don got thrown out of, uh, of the taverns in town, so you have to have something to do. So. <laughs> hey, Don, we appreciate very much your call, and we thank you for the date on that, for verifying that. You're having a good show, All and right, I'm enjoying yes. it, and go links. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, 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 bye now. Our number, by the by, yes. is 648-5510. Uh, if you have any questions or comments on the museum, uh, Please feel free to give us a call. We'd very much like to hear from you, and that's that's what Viewpoint's about. It's not our viewpoint; it's yours. So six four eight five five one zero. Point Thank well you. made. Point well made. You know, talking about uh, Lincoln, the the folks in that time they did quoted read for the law, uh, whatever that meant. And now, and for a long, long, long time, young men and and later young women, studied long, hard hours and passed really pretty stringent exams to become a lawyer. Uh, it was interesting that uh, how lawyers could become lawyers back in that time. Uh, do you have any comments about that do you, is your, in your studies in history? Uh, have you come across anything that related to that? Well, in studying Lincoln's law career, um, it's very interesting because today, uh, students will go to law school and then spend an extensive amount of time studying the law mm -hmm. and passing rigorous tests to, to move up to uh, different legal bars. Mm -hmm. Now in Lincoln's time, he was an apprentice. He studied under a person who already achieved um, stature in the field of law. Uh -huh. um, in the Midwest, we studied the Eastern law, so uh, the law books from New York um, and the New England states, mm -hmm. because Illinois was still developing as a state when Lincoln studied, tried to become a lawyer, and he studied under uh, John Todd Stewart for his first few years as um, a apprentice of the law. Mm -hmm. And interesting to go back a few years. Um, Lincoln actually met Stewart during the Black Hawk War and introduced Lincoln to law. Um, and Lincoln became fascinated. And when he moved to Springfield in 1837, he ended up studying law with 
uh, John Todd Stewart and learned how to be a good lawyer, how a courtroom was set up, how to fight for individuals' rights, um, but also be a good professional. Now, Stewart was very much involved politically and didn't have a lot of time to teach Mr. Lincoln. So Lincoln was only able to move up to the circuit. Then when Lincoln uh, dissolved his law partnership with Stewart, he ended up uh, forming a partnership with Logan. Now Logan was a very well-known politician, uh, a very experienced lawyer when Lincoln became his junior partner. And Stewart um, really was more focused on his career versus helping another. So when Logan came around, Lincoln learned a great deal. Um, and he learned to be a bit more of a professional in the courtroom. Um, as we study Lincoln's life, Lincoln was a bit relaxed. Um, Folksy. Yeah, he was, he was very much a person you could have a conversation with <clears throat> and he could relate well with individuals around him. But when it came to being in a courtroom, Lincoln tend to make it, he tended to make a few jokes now and then. Um, he had, he didn't charge as much as the average lawyer, uh, which he got in trouble for later on. Mm -hmm. um, but when he formed a partnership with Logan, he learned a great deal more about the law and was able to move up to the Illinois Supreme Court bar. Also during his partnership with Logan, he was able to have a lot more influence in his community. Now when Logan uh, dissolved the partnership uh, to form a family law firm with his son, Lincoln ended up becoming a senior partner for the first time with William Herndon. Now William Herndon um, was a clerk and apprentice under, under Lincoln and Logan. Um, and when Logan left, Herndon took the junior partner place and Lincoln finally became the senior partner. Gets a bit confusing over the years. Uh, he has, he's had three partners and there are a variety of different cases that are very important to Lincoln's law career that we show in the museum. Mm -hmm. um, we focus on um, a few, but I'm not gonna let those slip. I'll let you come to the museum and check them out. Okay. Um, but there are two cases that are very interesting. And when you look at Lincoln's life, we always like to look at the cases he had with freed African Americans um, and the cases he had with slave owners in the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, most of the time when Lincoln studied law, we would look at what we call today very boring cases. Um, and when you look at the law record, it, you don't really have a lot of exciting action in these uh, mm -hmm. law cases. Um, it's mostly, you owe me money, this is how much, and I'm taking you to court to make sure I get it. Yeah. Well, things uh, haven't changed dramatically then, have they? Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that took up most of Lincoln's law career. Um, he dealt with... Well, day in, day out law practice, is, uh, while mundane, uh, in the sense of the word of excitement and so forth, mm -hmm. no media, uh, uh, need for media, day in, day out in the courtrooms, but there's a whole lot of expertise that has to take place and a lot of hours of study before they appear in the respective courts, wherever they may be. Yes, and they, they didn't have a certificate. Uh, they didn't go to school. They studied under an individual, mm -hmm. and they learned by experience, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, a saying a lot because today we take a degree as being a sole background of an individual looking for a position. Uh, you go to school, that is right. what is expected of you, but during Lincoln's time, you spent a lot of time reading, a lot of time studying, and job shadowing individuals. Mm -hmm. And that's how Lincoln was able to earn his expertise. And in some interviews, if you, um, where Lincoln writes his bio autobiography, um, a lot of times he wrote it in third person, mm -hmm. but he goes on to say that if you added up all of his years of schooling, it would come to about a year where today lawyers have years and years of schooling. You know, and with respect to our current museum, which is now closed until next April, 2014, uh, but prior to our closing here in September, 
it was not unusual for you to, on any given day, to have uh, visitors from foreign countries walk in uh, at want to see our very modest little museum. Yes, uh, we've had visitors from Australia, New Zealand. Um, we've had some from France. Um, we've actually had some from India, Japan. Basically, you name a country, we've seen mm -hmm. visitors from it. And what's so interesting about these visitors is they come specifically to Illinois to learn about Lincoln uh, and basically soak in what Lincoln would have seen. So a lot of times when they come in, they came to see the Lincoln items. Mm -hmm. And they always look for the next Lincoln spot to go to, mm -hmm. which we are happy to point them in the direction of Postville and New Salem and other Lincoln sites in the central Illinois area. For it purposes is. of the museum, mm -hmm here uh, what what uh, did you glean about the partners the three separate partnerships that he was in what did these people think about him as he studied for law um well uh, a lot of them uh, all the quotes that we have looked at they are speaking about Lincoln's life as a politician and a good lawyer and they speak very highly of him though William Herndon tends to speak the most highly because um, he felt that he was the, the closest to Lincoln, mm -hmm. which if you look at Herndon's life, it was more like a father-son relationship. Um, <coughs> but when you look at Logan's accounts and Stewart's accounts, they always show the, the growth. They talk about the growth that Lincoln had uh, while he was serving as a junior partner for both of them. Mm -hmm. And Logan admired his, his work ethic. And a whole part of the museum is going to be dedicated to uh, an art called honesty. I think that's kind of nice. Well, we do have a, um, a I want to say slogan, uh, for lack of a better f word, um, but the goal that we have at our museum is for visitors to come in, learn from Lincoln's life, and live it. Um, Lincoln had a number of characteristics that amplified uh, really good, good character traits that we can apply to our life. Now given we don't drive a horse and buggy and live in a time where there were not ele any electricity or computers, um, where Lincoln had to, to read a lot to learn, um, but he also had life experiences that we can learn from. Kind of like when you sit down with your parents and you they warn you about certain roads that you may take um, and the consequences with some of the choices you make in your life. Um, Lincoln has certain characteristics like honesty and empathy, which is a section in our museum where we talk about how Lincoln valued honesty. Um, there was a quote that he, Lincoln gave in a law lecture stating that if you cannot be an honest lawyer, find another occupation. Uh, so Lincoln took honesty very seriously, uh, but he also had some characteristics that weren't so uh, beneficial for him. Uh, he showed a lot of empathy, but he, you find that people tend to walk over him at some points take in his advantage. life. Take um, advantage. Yeah, and take advantage. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the solid and most admirable trait that I find with Lincoln is his perseverance. He comes in contact with so many difficult individuals, but he always finds a way to get his point across. Like when uh, Mr. Lincoln finally comes to a decision on how he feels about the Kansas-Nebraska Act. In our new, mu in our new museum, we're going to be showing um, a little itty-bitty notebook. It's not very big. Um, but it's a very powerful notebook because in 1854, when the Kansas-Nebraska Act was implemented, Lincoln kept track of politicians in the state, what county they're from, what political party they're a part of, and whether they're for or against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Now, when he wrote this notebook, he was preparing to challenge Douglas um, on this decision, not the debates yet, but he was getting ready to come back into politics and make a stand. So, in August 26th of 1854, Lincoln goes to a very small town in southern Illinois called Winchester, Illinois, and gives his Winchester speech, and gives his first viewpoints on the Kansas-Nebraska Act. 
Now that speech becomes very important for the Peoria speech that is so well known by Lincoln scholars today. And that is what we want to highlight in our museum, is the characteristics that Lincoln had that we can use in our daily life. Beautiful. Make it live today. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of characteristics that have been put to the wayside that we need to bring back, um, that students really need to come to grips with. And during college, when you're facing this point in your life where you're becoming an adult and you're choosing paths to go down, you kind of need some guidance. And Lincoln is a good uh, individual to look at in regards to good character traits that will help you succeed in your adult life. And this can be applied even earlier as well. But since we're on Lincoln College campus, we like to involve our students as much as possible. You know, Judith, it just occurred to me, I didn't realize that your friend and my wife uh, had studied Lincoln because she knows how to get a, make a, get a point across. <laughs> <laughs> so she's a, she's a good... Uh, good debater I guess yeah. <laughs> now I'd like to get a point across um, we had commercials just a few minutes ago uh, I'm going to put a per commercial in it just occurred to me uh, this lovely Lincoln Center which will be the home of our uh, of our new museum um, not quite paid for it folks um, the board of trustees thought long and hard about going ahead with this project uh, and did with the uh, faith that uh, we're going to be able to continue to get contributions to get that little rascal paid for. It's an important, an important adjunct to our community, excuse me please, <clears throat> uh, commercially, because we bring a lot of folks in here. We'll drop a nickel and a dime here and there in the community. Uh, so it's, a com it's an important thing to the benefit of the uh, commercial health of the community. But uh, we just felt very strongly that this was a uh, needed uh, addition to our campus, uh, not only for the athletics that uh, we enjoy up there. By the way, that's a wonderful arena as far as a basketball arena and volleyball. But uh, more, moreover, it was a museum which we felt so strongly about because we were so cramped down through the years and we had all these wonderful artifacts to, to display and simply couldn't do it. So we have this new museum that's going to open up next uh, April, and uh, uh, I suspect that uh, the uh, administration trustees uh, would look very kindly upon a check that might come their way, uh, make, make it out to the benefit of the museum. So that's my commercial, Mr. Rash. <laughs> you want to charge us for that? I can tell you. I'll take, I'll take care of it. Put it on my tab. <laughs> can I add to your commercial? Yeah. <laughs> um, our museum has a wonderful soiree every year, and uh, September 28th, we are having our annual soiree uh, where, you, where the ladies get a chance to dress up and the men get to benefit by seeing lovely ladies, um, uh, but we get the presence of their company as well. Uh, but this year, uh, it's going to be an extra special occasion because you'll get a sneak peek of the new museum. Oh my. So September 28th, our soiree starts at 5 o'clock with a viewing of the new museum um, with hors d'oeuvres at 6 and then dinner at 7. But um, the ticket price is about $85. Yes, it is. And feel free to contact the museum if you are interested in attending the soiree. Um, but we always have a lovely time. It and is. Uh, this year we're having a group of Civil War dancers come and perform for us as well. So we have a lot of fun entertainment, and we also have um, a jazz group from Lincoln College that's going to help uh, perform and set the mood for the evening. And uh, we always have a wonderful time, and this will be your only time to have a sneak peek of the museum before we open in April. Well, you stepped in there at just the right time. It's a, uh, <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to make sure we, we covered the soiree. That is a big, uh, it's a big thing in the, in the community life. It's a big thing in the life of our college. Uh, and it, it raises a nickel or two for our museum. Uh, we have auctions, uh, silent auctions, and, and uh, also live auctions there. It's, all in all, it's a good time. And uh, um, by the way, uh, in communication with my good friend, our good friend, uh, uh, former Senator Larry Bomke, uh, have, they've been coming down through the years. And even though he's not in public life per se anymore, uh, they want to come and be a part of that. 
which speaks to the quality of, of, of the life there at, the, at our museum. So we appreciate all the interest. Tickets are available, and they can be obtained through the uh, uh, museum. Uh, so so uh, be sure, is the college number is 732-3155. It has to be directed to your museum with a switchboard there. And make reservations. It's not a closed party, folks. It's open to the public. Mm -hmm. And there's limited seats available. Uh, so make sure you call ahead early uh, because they tend to fill up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will. Yeah, we will need to have it uh, reservations in early. Uh, and we've always tried to close the viewpoint with a program that hopefully that has something to do with the topic of the morning. Uh, primarily, you're here in the educational field. I found one by uh, uh, William Allen White, the great old uh, educator from the uh, state of Canvas. And old Bill White says, in education, we are striving not to teach youth to make a living, but to make a life. Thank you for Viewpoint. Thank you, Ann Mosley, very much. <laughs>